He woke up in his own bed, fully clothed, sometime after midnight. His pillow and the back of his shirt were sticky with half-dried blood. He managed to make it to the bathroom before vomiting for ten minutes straight, not that there was anything in his stomach. Afterwards, he sat on the floor, shaking and crying, clutching his knees to his chest and praying like a sinner at Christmas. He'd lost faith in his father's God around the same time his mother started telling him she wished he'd never been born, but any port in the storm. His face was bruised and tender, and his whole head was aching. His wrists were cut badly from struggling against the handcuffs, the wounds ragged and ugly. He could barely move his left arm for the soreness in his shoulder. He was shaking so badly he could hardly see straight, biting back sobs into truncated whimpers, his mind a violent cascade of white noise terror. There was a knock at the door. He froze, except for the shaking, which he couldn't quite manage to stop. His head was pounding, his heart beat so loud in his ears the neighbors must have been able to hear it. He willed the anonymous knocker to go away, but twenty seconds later the sound came again, more insistent, accompanied by a female voice calling, Daniel? Unsteadily he got to his feet, propping himself up on the vanity. He staggered to the door, his vision still blurry with tears that would not stop, and opened it. Miss Sue, his neighbor from apartment A, was standing on his doorstep. She was a plump little Chinese woman, her tightly bunned hair sliding down the gradient from black to white, face crinkled from smiling often, who lived with her on her own with several cats. She gave Daniel cookies from time to time in exchange for him cat-sitting when she went out of town. She gasped, and her eyes went wide in horror when she saw his face. "'Oh, my goodness, Daniel, what happened?' she cried. "'Are you all right?' Instead of replying, Daniel burst into racking sobs and nearly crumpled to the ground. Miss Sue took his elbow and helped him to his couch, fussing over him like a mother hen. "'Oh, goodness, you're bleeding. And your face, good grief. Shh, sh Daniel, it's okay, it's all right.' Let me get you some ice and something to wrap up those wrists. Lord, she said aside to herself, bustling into his kitchen. Daniel tried to recover himself while she was gone, wiping his face and eyes and nose and reminding himself to breathe. But the only thing he could think was, They're going to kill me. They're going to kill me. They're going to kill me. Miss Sue returned with a couple of wrap bandages from the first aid kit under Daniel's sink and a bag of frozen peas wrapped in Daniel's only dishcloth, a relic from his days living with his mother. She wrapped up his wrists, gently, talking softly to him the whole time, praising him for his courage as though he were a child with a splinter. She let him press the frozen peas to his face himself, then hurried off again, returning with a damp washcloth, likely pilfered from Daniel's clean laundry. She dabbed the back of his head with the washcloth while Daniel pressed the makeshift ice pack to his swollen cheek. When he seemed calm enough to speak, she asked again, What happened, Daniel? He took a deep breath, but before he could get any coherent sentence together, the panic came bubbling out. They're going to kill me, he gasped, and dissolved into tears again, trembling. Miss Sue's face hardened. I'm calling the peacekeepers, she said, pulling out her phone. No! Daniel sobbed. No! They said... They said not to... Open your mouth about this, and you'll find a gun in it. Don't... Please, Miss Sue, they'll kill me! She shook her head stolidly, the phone already held to her ear. Daniel didn't have the strength to stop her. His head felt like it was going to split right down the middle. No one is going to kill you, Daniel. Not while I'm here. Hello? She said. Yes, this is Yancheng Su. I'm down on Cherry Street, apartment 2012B. My neighbor, Daniel Rodriguez, has been assaulted. He says they threatened to kill him if he told anyone. Uh, how long? Yes. Yes, I can put him on. She held out the phone to Daniel. They're on their way. They should be here in five minutes. She wants to talk to you. 
Shakily, Daniel put the phone to his ear. Hello? He stammered. The shaking had gone right through to his voice box. Mr. Rodriguez? My name is Dana. I'm the dispatcher for your area. I'm going to stay on the line with you until the peacekeepers arrive. Is that all right? See, um, yes, Daniel replied, expecting at any moment a bullet to go tearing through his head. Are you at home, Mr. Rodriguez? Dana the dispatcher asked. Yes, Daniel said again. Do you need any medical attention? I don't... I don't think so, no. They... They hit me in the head, but it's just a bruise and a little cut, I think. Miss Sue snorted. Little is not the word, she said, her voice raised so the dispatcher could hear her. The whole back of his head is covered in blood, and something happened to his wrists, too, like handcuffs or something. Very ugly wounds. Daniel swallowed, trying not to think about it. Okay, he said. I might need medical attention. I'll send an ambulance, too. Sit tight, Mr. Rodriguez. We'll make sure you're safe and well cared for. The squad car is only a couple of blocks from your apartment, and a few more are on the way just to make sure. We take this sort of thing very seriously. She paused, and ev evidently could still hear Daniel's ragged breathing through the phone. Where are you from? she asked. He tried to breathe focusing on the question at hand instead of the dread filling his belly like lead. To, uh, Tucson, he answered. Moved up here for college. Well, um, really, L.A., and then here. Tucson's a great city, she said. Where'd you go to college? UCLA, he said. Computer science. Class of 33. Congratulations! That's a great school. I'm out of Virginia Tech myself. How are you liking San Fran? Daniel laughed shakily. <laughs> Pretty good, uh, apart from... from today. Don't you even worry about today, Mr. Rodriguez. The car will be there in a little over three minutes, and I promise you they will make sure you're safe. Miss Sue was still gently cleaning the blood off the back of his head, clucking to herself and shaking her head. That washcloth was going to be ruined. Daniel tried not to think about the blood or the bruise or the possibility that the hole in the back of his head might have been much, much bigger. Three minutes seemed like an eternity. I'm just really, really scared, Daniel admitted, trying not to cry again. He started hiccuping instead. They said, they said they'd get Kill me if I to told anybody. It's going to be all right, Mr. Rodriguez, Dana assured him. The SFPD is here to protect you. Whoever these people were, they're not going to be able to hurt you again. One of the peacekeepers on the way will take a statement from you, and we'll have somebody on the case by morning at the latest. As I said, we take these things very seriously. Th thank you, Daniel said. He tried to collect himself. He needed something else to focus on, something to distract him. You said you went, went to Virginia te Tech? That's right. I've been in San Fran for, well, close on ten years now. Long enough for it to be home, at any rate. I've been volunteering as a dispatcher here for the past five years, too, so you can trust me when I tell you that you're going to be all right. I know it seems like an eternity to wait, but the car is just around the corner. Right on cue, blue lights flashed through Daniel's window. They're here, he said, not an ounce of relief in him. But at least the hiccups had subsided. Okay, Mr. Rodriguez. I'm going to hang up now. Is that okay? The keepers will take good care of you. Daniel swallowed, then nodded gingerly. Okay, he said, and thank you, again. Take care, Mr. Rodriguez, she said, and the call ended. Concurrently, there was a knock on the door. Peacekeepers, someone called. Let me get that for you, sweetheart, 
Miss Sue said, getting to her feet. You just stay there and keep that ice pack on. She toddled to the door and opened it. I'm his neighbor, she said, all business. He's in the living room. Miss Sue came back, trailing two peacekeepers behind her. They were both tall and svelte, their uniforms crisp and brilliantly white, guns and stun sticks on their hips. Mr. Rodriguez? One asked. He was a weathered man in his forties, with salt and pepper mustache, a deep and authoritative voice that would have been perfect for radio, and a hard cast to his eyes. Daniel somehow managed a smile. That's me, he said. My name is Keeper Jackson. This is Keeper Rivera, he said, indicating the other man, who inclined his head peacefully. We'll be staying with you until the EMTs get here. Is it all right if we sit down? Finally, at long last, Daniel's body caught up with the idea that it wasn't going to die in the next two minutes, and he found himself slowly relaxing. You men want coffee? Miss Sue asked. I could use a cup myself. Yes, please, said Keeper Rivera, his voice lightly accented with something round and soft. I could do with one, Keeper Jackson conceded, settling into one of Daniel's government-issue armchairs. Daniel? Miss Sue asked. Um, sure, he said. Thanks, Miss Sue. She waved a hand. Call me Yanching, she said, heading into the kitchen. It spits, Daniel called, suddenly recalling Minami's encounter with the machine. How long ago had that been? It felt like years. They all do, honey, Yanching replied back. There was a sputtering hiss as the machine started up, and Daniel turned his bloodshot eyes back to the two peacekeepers in his room. Keeper Jackson had taken out a slim black notepad and was scrolling through it quickly. Now, Mr. Rodriguez, Keeper Jackson said, looking up from the pale glow of his notepad screen. Could you tell us what happened? Anything at all that you remember. Every detail helps. Daniel shook his head, eyes fixed on the coffee table with its familiar stains and scratches. I don't, he began, then amended, I can't. They said... He started shaking again, and his hand clenched on the half-melted bag of peas. They said they'd kill me. He finished in a hoarse whisper. Mr. Rodriguez, Keeper Rivera said, and he pronounced the name right, without a hint of Americanization. He pronounced it better than Daniel usually self-consciously did. We are here to help you. We are here to make sure that these men cannot hurt you again. We cannot do that if you don't tell us what happened. Daniel looked up at him. He was leaning forward in his chair, soft eyes intent on Daniel. How old was he? Twenty-six? Twenty-seven? He had freckles and kept his black hair cut close to the scalp. He smiled, just a touch and said earnestly, Podemos ayudarte. And suddenly the whole story was spilling out of Daniel, in all its terrifying, emasculating detail, right down to the very words he'd spouted for the man with the gun. It was only when he stopped talking that he realized he'd made the entire speech in Spanish. Jackson was looking desperately at Keeper Rivera, who had not moved. There was a quiet beep as Rivera touched a finger to his right ear. Apparently he'd just saved a recording of Daniel's statement. Okay, Mr. Rodriguez, he said. Thank you. Do you remember anything else about the two men? Daniel shook his head. I, I couldn't see either of them. I'm not... I'm not even sure the other one was a man, he admitted. Another car arrived just then, as well as the promised ambulance. Another keeper took quick photographs of Daniel's injuries, forcing him to unwrap the bandages around his wrists, exposing the torn skin to the air again, before handing him over to the EMTs, who essentially told him to keep doing what he was doing with the ice, ten minutes on and ten minutes off, until his cheek felt better, although they did put a small bandage over the cut. They checked him for concussion, shining lights in his eyes, checking his pulse, 
asking about the date and if he knew where he was. They cleaned, disinfected, and sprayed some instant bandage on the back of Daniel's head, which only served to make it stickier and itchier, and warned him not to scratch it or even wash it for the next two hours at least. They took a blood sample in the hopes of figuring out what sort of tranquilizer had been used on him. They rebandaged his wrists after giving him a mild anesthetic and carefully cutting off the tattered skin at the edges of the wounds, which was disconcerting but admittedly did make them look less awful. When they had gone, Miss Sue brought the coffee in and settled herself on the couch next to Daniel, gently rubbing his back with one hand. It wasn't exactly comforting, since it pressed his blood-caked shirt against his back, but it was better than sitting all alone, cold and shaking, barely able to hold his coffee without spilling it. Although his tongue felt leaden, and he wanted nothing more than to curl up in a ball and sleep until winter, he asked the keepers, How long will you be staying? As long as you'd like us to, Keeper Jackson replied in his radio voice. There'll be another patrol car with two keepers in it circling the block all night. Rivera and I don't have anywhere else to be tonight, do we, Miguel? Keeper Rivera shook his head. We're at your disposal, Mr. Rodriguez. I work from home, Miss Sue told Daniel. I can stay as long as you want, or you can kick me out, too. I just have to go feed the cats in the morning. Daniel set down his coffee and put his face in his hands. I just don't want to think about it anymore, he said. He sighed, then looked up at the keepers as a thought occurred to him, his eyebrows lifted in a wry question. Any of you ever played Tower Assault? 